Welcome to Strategicon. Hello world, I'm John Bruni and you're listening to Strategicon, your window to all things security and foreign affairs. Audience, thanks for your patience. It's been quite a while since our last podcast in December of last year. We apologize for this unusual break in transmission. There were some strange things happening at the beginning of 2023 around my work schedule and that of producer Michael's. I was drawn into planning for a major defense exhibition and conference scheduled for 2024 here in Adelaide. And Michael was drawn away from us to sunny Queensland for a bit of army reserve training. But the gang is back and we are ready to rumble like the proverbial Leopard 2 main battle tank. Today from the UK at the unholy hour of 2am, we are joined once again by Roderick Miller. Over one year into the Russia-Ukraine war, we check in to see what Rod's hyper-realist perspective says about this awful human calamity. Now, Roderick, um, we need to talk about a couple of things. Uh, Let's initially start off with the Russia-Ukraine war. Belarus is offering to station Russian nuclear weapons on its soil. Should we be concerned by this development, or is this just another one of Putin's many nuclear weapons scare campaigns? Uh, How do I put this? Belarus is independent in name only and has been pretty much from the minute we tried to overthrow the Belarusian government in a... uh, color revolution not so long ago. Putin went in, he saved them, he's their boss, it's part of Russia in all but name. It's a nice legal need, a nicety for them. Um, Belarus doesn't have to necessarily face any of the sanctions that Russia gets from the West. It's a good way of, uh, in the future, negotiating a way once the crazies are out of office in Europe. Mm-hmm. But Belarus is Russia. Yeah, and David, so it doesn't matter. If oh, saying. sorry, sorry about that. Well, what, what no, 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 no. So it's the time lag thing. <laughs> That's all right. I, 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 having seen many YouTube videos, I understand that this is a common occurrence between you know hosts and co-hosts and guests. You know, you always have that little second time lag where you think the other person's finished, and then you talk on top of them. It's a terrible thing. Uh, David, what what do you think about this this notion of um, um, Russian weapons being stationed in Belarus? I think two things about it are worth talking about. One, yeah, you know, it's a pretty logical thing to do, and I completely agree with Roderick that Belarus is part of Russia, even though most of the population might rather not be. The reality is, everyone who controls the state is essentially their survival depends on Russia. I think there's two significant things about this. One, what's the real advantage in the short term? And the advantage in the short term is it will provide a high level of cover when Russia eventually do a thunder run towards Kiev with 300,000 recently trained troops and a whole lot of refurbished armour that quite possibly will end the war. Uh, The second side of this is look at when it was announced. It was announced straight after Putin and Xi met and it all looked like everything was lovely. And then Xi went home and immediately invited everyone from the Astans to come to China and have a big chat about the middle corridor and didn't invite Putin. Mm-hmm. So it's simultaneously something that Russia absolutely needs to do and an indication that I think the CCP thinks Ukraine slash Russia is a shit show. I think there's another, I'm, I'm not sold on yours, but I do think there's another one you need to keep in mind is we are not paying attention to how emotionally um, harmful the idea of depleted uranium is being sent to Ukraine to the Russians because they purged their entire system of depleted uranium. They don't want anything of it anywhere near anywhere near Russia. And the minute Britain said the challengers will have depleted re- uranium rounds of like, no, we're putting our foot down. You know? So, I mean, I'm not dismissing David's component, but we're missing how pissed off they were about that. Sorry, they're you. pissed off about it because it's a tank killer, not because they're pissed off about DU as DU. It's yeah, yeah, hang, DU on, hang on, hang on, hang on, yeah, guys, 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 guys. The Russians have DU 
themselves. And again, you know, there have been unverified reports that Russians have been using DU in the field on their T-80s. Now, they can't put the DU into the T-54 or T-64, but the fact of the matter is that the Russians themselves have stockpiles of DU. Should this have been such a big deal for the Russians, considering the fact that they do have their own stocks? So really, in the end, NATO supplies depleted uranium shells for their you know, challenger tanks at the very least. But the Russians, if they really wanted to unleash hell on Ukraine, could have and probably has already used depleted uranium. Well, I assume it will be part of the thunder run to Kiev when that you know, invasion starts because that invasion is going to be for keeps mm -hmm. and it's going to be there that we're going to see the challenges and the Abrams and the Leopards used as striker brigades to try and stop the loss of Kiev. So that is going to be a new level of awful compared to anything we've seen yet. Mm. My view is they have no problem with depleted uranium in Germany, in uh, Spain, maybe marching through um, Austria or something. But Ukraine is now Russia, and there's no DU going to be used on Russia. That's the component. You don't get to use it on Russia. And Ukraine is going to be Russia. Yeah. It, it, again, this would just be part of the shit show that's coming ahead. As to their stockpiles, they have huge stockpiles. They did just like us. They went down that, mm. but then they had an allergic reaction to it. It's it's kind of like them and and bioweapons. They came a line, they got right up to the line, and then they went. This is a mistake. Draw no, back. it's not. And it's yeah, not they, a mistake. It's the realization that in such a corrupt system full of people who will sell or steal anything and where the factions will do almost anything there's no cohesive way to control it that's a reasonable assertion yeah but at any rate whether you're right about channel or not i don't know um, i need to mull over that one but everything i saw was this depleted uranium is a step too far so but, is yeah it does go uh, go on Roderick. I was going I don't I don't think ultimately they matter because Belarus is Russia. Mm. Is is Putin's status as uh Xi's junior ally now complete? Following on from the big meeting, the big power between Xi and Putin. I don't think junior I I, I think they are now partners, but here's the reality. On the battlefield, Russia wins. In the economy, China wins. The two have no incentive to fight each other. And we gave them that. So yeah, yeah, the only friend they've change. got is each other, even if it's a shit show. And it is because they don't like each other. They don't agree with anything other than they've got no one else they can work with. Well, they got North Korea. Yeah, yeah but sorry, them you just want to keep in a box. <laughs> And periodically pour in enough oil and rice that it doesn't explode. Yeah. Well. They're very successfully getting India. And that's Lavrov. And that's Putin. India's coming on board. Modi's, and, Modi's India's coming on board. Well, that's going to have some interesting repercussions for the Quad. Yes. What's, what's the Quad ever done? Nothing. Well, that's also true. Right. So <laughs> where, where's the issue? Well, there's no real issue. Uh, but, you know, politics is all about perception. And, you know, we've had a couple of governments here in Australia now giving the perception that the Quad is actually something. What it is, I don't know. No one's really successfully explained it. It's not an alliance. It's an alignment of sorts. But it's based on three very tightly bound US allies to one strategically autonomous player which is indian and that strategic autonomy the indians are not willing to sacrifice for anybody including for the mighty joe biden so yeah i mean what only works with trump you don't have trump you don't have the quad and there, there is nobody on the republican side and there's nobody on the democrat side who can get right india back emotionally because mm. they love trump Oh, they did. Well, that is, that is true. That is true. Actually, and that really comes down to the strength of leader versus leader relations mm. in terms of how this all plays out. You know, I mean, Xi and Putin seem to get on reasonably well, you know, for whatever their ultimate aim happens to be. 
Uh, Trump got on reasonably well with pretty much every autocrat he could get his grubby little hand uh, onto. Um, but, uh, you know, Biden, of course, is trying to rectify that and, and reverse course. Has this been, has Biden's strategy... Oh, oh hold on, hold on, hold on. Sorry, John, I have to interrupt that. Uh -huh. um, you want the other side to be friendly with you. Trump did the right thing. Did he? Biden is a fanatic. He scared the bejesus out of everybody. And, and Trump wined and dined them. Um, but, 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 but if you, if you were going to say, if you say that, then isn't, aren't you opening the door to the uh, accusation of um, apologizing for appeasement? You know, because, I mean, Trump was an appeaser. He, yes, he, sure, he, he didn't want to have war with Russia, but he also wanted to sit down and have his photo opportunity and a cup of tea with Vladimir Putin. Um, you know, Russia during the Trump period was probably not considered a friend nor an enemy. It was, you to use the millennial vernacular, a frenemy, right, of the United States. But certainly it wasn't a country that the Americans could trust with any, with any degree of certainty. And I think that they were quite right not to trust them. Um, and with but regard to... This, this is no different to... to Kissinger in, in the 60s trying to do triangulation. I mean, the, the point of the matter is this. A, it's normal diplomacy. B, appeasement is only a bad word because Hitler was a sociopath. And he had the ability behind Germany to, in, in fact, there's no evidence that Xi is a sociopath. There's no evidence that Putin is a sociopath. We portray Putin as a Hitler. In reality, Hitler, Hitler um, in reality, Putin Hitler. is... <laughs> it is a liberal democrat and a moderate it's only because he's president of russia that he has to be a hardliner and compared to all the people around him he's the most moderate person in the room oh, well, I mean, if, you, if you went to go uh, if you went to say warsaw and, and and you know said that or you went to any eastern european country barring hungary um, you know, you would probably get a lot of pushback on that. You know, I mean, there were Eastern European countries that had That's been occupied by the Soviet Union and who had who had felt the lash of Soviet rule for quite some time. So you would say that those East European countries were quite right not to think that the bear was some sort of cuddly, soft power that they could, you know, cozy up against and and com, you know, allow them allow them to be caught in the trap between competing for Moscow's attention or Brussels' attention or the Western capital's attention. If you don't believe in the EU project, um, that was never the case. Uh, Russia always portrayed itself as an aggressive, belligerent state, whether it was czarist, whether it was commissarist or whether it is Putinist. There is a historical continuum in the way that Russia presents itself to the world, but particularly in its so-called spheres of influence. Now, if you happen to be under the jackboot of Russia or have had that experience, surely the idea of being in the Western liberal orbit would be far more attractive and alluring than the prospect of being joined to Russia, where Russia has really not much to offer other than you can be conscripted into the army and we will tell you, we, you can see the world, you can go to Africa and do the good fight, you know? I mean, what, well, is, what is the soft power but, that Russia ever had to attract the East Europeans, including the Ukrainians, to their okay, So let's, let's do a really important thing that we all miss in the Western world. Tsarist Russia and revolutionary Russia and Stalinist Russia, the Estonians, the Latvians, all those uh, Baltic countries, the uh, Chihuahua states, their ruling classes were disproportionately empowered in those systems. And not only that, they disproportionately populated the dodgy parts of it, the NKVD, the um, oh, KGB, um yeah the death squads they they kind of lost a lot of power at the end of the soviet period and they really lost out once they were kicked out of the the soviet union so these are people who had massively disproportionate power they've also got the the uh, the money of being part of the west and they've got nothing else to sell the only thing they have to sell is russia's a baddie 
so they sell it. And, you know, if you'd asked me 10 years ago, I would have said they were right. But they got, there's a shark and they jumped it. And they jumped it about 10 years ago. Because Putin is not Hitler. Because Russia is not Germany in 1938. We, mm. we, we've oversold the message. And, and, you know, these people are deeply embedded. America's, uh, what's the term they use? Penetrated hegemony. It's so deeply penetrated by Eastern Europeans that those ideas and, and the narrative and the, and the marketing of how bad Russia is, is deeply infused into the American uh, political elite. And also Britain's. I mean, it's, it's deep here. The Russophobia is very, very, very powerfully embedded here. And it comes largely from Eastern European immigrant populations who were disenfranchised by the end of the Soviet Union. All right. If you were saying that, then, you know, I would have to ask you, what, what, were, what were the positives that Russia gave Eastern Europe to not align with NATO and or the European Union? or the West generally, what were the, after this fall of the Soviet Union, what would have been the key ingredients that East Europeans would have checked off their list saying, okay, you know, the Soviet Union is over, the Russian jackboots off our throats, and, you know, we can, we can afford to just hang out as independent, uh, neutral countries in Europe, so Russia doesn't feel freaked out, and NATO doesn't get freaked out, and we're a belt of countries just happily sitting in the middle. What would have been the, th what would have been the key takeaway um, uh, from, from, say, for instance, the, uh, the East European perspective that they could have gotten away with that sort of policy? Because I don't see it, Roderick. I don't see it. I, I don't it's know, great power I don't politics. Know how you could. Hey? So think of it this way. Their narrative is a drug. Their narrative that Russia is bad is a drug. Yeah, but, but beyond the narrative, be, beyond the narrative what does Russia problem? offer East Nothing. Europeans in terms of an alternative to being a belligerent state and a potential occupier? Um, well, it, it offers cheap commodities, cheap resources, cheap energy. Apart from that, nothing. Security? That is the problem. Does it offer security? Russia? I mean, the security does, can do, only be... do East Europeans even have a right to actually think that they could live securely in a non-aligned Eastern European fictional entity? With Sweden with, had it for uh, ages. Finland had it on the side. Hey? Swindler, Sweden, Finland, they had it for ages. The, the, the deal was we have a nice peaceful bit in between. NATO doesn't rub up against Russia. Russia doesn't rub up against Europe. And the guys in the, in the middle get rich on the transaction. That was supposed to be the deal. And then Clinton stabbed them in the back. Clinton and Bush ended the the, the post-war post-cold war arrangement which was neutrality in between all right david i think we're trying to go into an ideological angle here that is unnecessarily complicated and we don't have enough data to reach meaningful conclusions the simple thing is the soviet union could not sustain itself economically collapsed under its own weight and the gravy stopped flowing and for anyone that got out fast and early that could look west easily, it appeared there was lots of gravy in the west. And you come up with whatever story you need to bullshit to get access to gravy. So Sweden and Finland could live in the middle because by being in the middle, there was enough money to be made. So there, Roderick's right. It was simply about the capacity to do okay in a difficult situation. But when the Soviet Union collapsed because it could not function economically, there was a delusion that the neoliberal system could continue to just throw money into things and that would last forever. And this is really why the last 10 years has got so confusing because there isn't enough money left and the West is not willing to throw it around to sustain the former Soviet states in the way they became accustomed to in the 90s and early 2000s. The cash flow the from way... both sides has ended. Yeah. And the only way they get the money is by Russia being bad and Russia being scary, Russia being Germany 1939. Well, again, the Germany 1939 bit, that's us looking at from the West. Really, the Eastern Europeans are smart enough to go, 
those people who tower east will change their mind in a heartbeat and change history in a heartbeat. At least in the West, once cash flows, the system's sclerotic and will flow for a while. So it's the thing between people who can be really difficult in a millisecond and people who can only be really difficult in a year. And I know what I'd rather pick. Yeah. There is there is another there is another interesting angle to all of this, and that is the position of Sweden and Finland now, because they're so keen to scramble over their line to, you know, join NATO. I mean, if they profited so well under the old system, being neutral countries making money from both sides, why could they not do that now? What's changed? that made them flip sides, basically, abandon neutrality and move west? What is the big issue? Well, fundamentally, Finland's been doing it for nearly 20 years. They are the closest thing to a NATO military that isn't NATO in the world. And they did that of their own accord. They've been hedging towards this since the early 2000s. Their level of interoperability is better than Australia's with NATO forces. So there's nothing fast about that. And Sweden made a gratuitous amount of money out of selling weapons and IKEA furniture to the entire world during the Cold War. Um, and there's another opportunity here to be on the right side of the arms business. Yeah. Yeah, okay. It is money. I mean, it's, it's money and it's also infiltration by ideologues. But that's that's all of us, everybody apart from maybe Hungary, and, and Turkey all have that. Yeah, but that's because Turkey's got its own ideology and because Hungary is sort of so lost in what it's meant to be and where it's meant to fit, it wants its own ideologically ideology at the cost of its own future. So Turkey has one, Hungary wants one. Yeah, I mean, Hungary's future depends on how far the Russians go. If the Russians go to Lviv, Hungary has a future. If they don't, they're, they're going to be strangled on the vine. Well, again, let's put economic context into this. Early 1990s, the Germans roll every factory they possibly can east. Poland's factories are coming to their end now. Um, the Czech's factories got upgraded and the Czechs actually make nice stuff and can develop technology on their own for manufacturing. The Slovakians, the Slovenians, again, the factories are running out. The interesting country in all this that never got any factories was Hungary. By the time Hungary unscrambled its egg to the point of being able to hold its hand out and go, please, can we have an economy? The Germans had pretty much moved in everything they wanted to move, and Hungary missed the boat. As a consequence of missing that boat, the only direction it can look is towards Russia, even though historically that would have freaked it out which is why they can have such a strange political elite now, because they know that nothing in history says this is a good idea. But also, historically, they should have had a deal from the West, and they didn't. So they are so lost and confused. It's the only game available to them. You know, They will put whatever spin on it they need to make it look like it's pro-hungry, when all it is is, please don't let us die. Yeah, that's the thing. If the board is there, they, they will flourish. And yeah. if it's not there... They will they will die on the vine. Yeah, because again, they've been dying literally since they got out from under communism. There has been no surge of awesomeness. There was no period of young people going woohoo, look, education, opportunity, and more money. That's all been skipped in Hungary. Although there is one interesting development in Hungary, which tends not to get the media headlines. And I, I was listening to uh, a podcast, one of those Jordan B. Peterson pod, uh, podcasts, and they were talking about population and, and the importance of a young population to a country's future. Of all the European states that have tried and failed to tackle the population problem, Hungary seems to be teetering on the verge of modest success in raising their own population of, of younger Hungarians. Yeah, largely because unlike the Poles and the Czechs and the Bulgarians and the Romanians, they couldn't easily move to Europe. The Hungarian government made it too hard. So fundamentally... Yeah, they didn't breed any yeah. more humans. Yeah. yeah, they just couldn't leave. So yeah. you know, uh, having been out on the on the outer for a while, um, if, for instance, things were to radically change against Russia and the Orban government dies in the wall, and then a pro-Western 
government, uh, you know, comes into being in Budapest? I mean, is that going to be something that will allow the Germans to rethink its position with regard to the Hungarians, considering that they have got an, well, basically an untouched economy they can go into and exploit? I'll explain it even differently to that, and that is, screw the Germans, they're too slow. The people who are fast are BlackRock. <laughs> if BlackRock are going to make money out of the war and potentially rebuild Ukraine if it manages to win, how hard is it to do the same thing with one more bordered country? Mm-hmm. It's all about how much but, money the 1% can make, nothing else. But yeah. the likelihood of that win is so tiny. Yeah, but again, it comes back to BlackRock. Do BlackRock care? They own 20% of defence shares in major US defence companies. The longer this war goes on, the more money they make. And if the Ukrainians who don't want to be part of Russia all flee rest, BlackRock will still have you know, the contracts to build and do everything along the Polish border to make the new front line. So either way, it's nothing to do with war anymore and simply down to how rich can the rich get. If the Russians do win, Hungary is the, um, is, is the entry point into Europe for the Chinese Belt and Road. Yeah. And... And then they make all the money. Yep. And so, again, this is why I think you know, Turkey is so desperately working on the middle corridor now, knowing that if they don't get the middle corridor up and running now, it will never happen. So, and uh, I think the Chinese will win in the end. They're, they're, they're offering more money, ultimately. At the end of the day, they're offering more money in the long run. Just the Americans through BlackRock are offering more money now. Yeah, but more money now is becoming very significant to most people who are hungry. Now, it's that old thing, you promised me gold tomorrow, food today, food today wins. Yeah. It doesn't matter if I'm not alive tomorrow. And the other side of this too is, again, something that's very hard getting good numbers on, but we're seeing delays worldwide still on deliveries of products from China. Shipping still appears to be no higher than 60% pre-COVID levels. Um, Manufacturing must therefore be low because you wouldn't be making it and stacking it in ports and containers for a year. There's no point. So as much as the Chinese are throwing money around, the question has to start being asked, okay, Turkey's upping its ability to make things dramatically. Americans are moving companies back to Mexico as fast as they can do it. India is getting more manufacturing than it's ever had. Uh, Vietnam is going through the roof. Indonesia is going through the roof. Even Thailand under the generals is getting more manufacturing. And even Malaysia that really doesn't do manufacturing very well other than bits and pieces of the mid-level chip market is getting more manufacturing. So the point here is when Dr. Doom comes out and said, you can no longer call China the factory of the world, that what we've actually got to the point now is four or five growing sources of production where shipping might be more reliable, where timeframes might be better. You'll pay more for it, but you'll get it sooner. Um, you know, China will always be a mega regional power. But if it can't deliver cheap stuff on time at the moment, it's providing an opportunity for further destabilization of trade. And that does really seem to be happening. Yes. There's other things you've got to keep in mind, though. And that big thing is we in Western Europe can't buy it. Sooner or later, once the price of our fuel really, really kicks in, winter of next year, spring yeah. of the year after um it doesn't matter how much the chinese can make we That's can't awesome. buy it yeah and by then and because turkey is so close anything made in turkey becomes your best bet because the cost is so much cheaper because of fuel yeah yeah but okay. I, I think ultimately what what we will get is all of these what was that uh term uh, world island all of those world island economies will integrate much more thoroughly. I, I think, you know, if you look at the 17th, 18th, 19th and 20th century, what was a hundred year period of like Britain being the technological power and it's starting with fabric and then America and Germany kicking in and then now China, then Russia and then China, that hundred year period became a 50 year period in the 20th century, yeah. it's become a 30 year period now. Um, so, and I think we're some way into that 30 year period. I think we're probably about 10 years into it. So 
after India, we are going to have Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. You're already going to get it starting in Nigeria. But they can't all compete with one another if they're all making the same stuff. So they're going to have to specialize. Well, either that or we get the Embrema argument of pivot states and clients and basically a divided world that resembles more of 17th century empires who don't interact. Because mm. again, who's going to pay for security? And if what you need to secure more than anything is water and food, um, then manufactured goods may also be inside your bubble. Because if we're going to have so many bubbles staring at each other, every bubble has to have competence because you don't know who you can trust to trade with. So it seemed the Americans have sorted their bubble. There realistically is a Japan Australia bubble if we look after Southeast Asia. Africa's going to get more you know, ability to make things than it's had for a long time. Latin America is the interesting one because there's so much social mayhem at the moment. It looks like it's stalling economic development again. So we got the number of things going on at the moment, like looking at Ukraine and China is, well, most days I just don't bother anymore because most of the information we get is garbage. Whereas what we're seeing is the flow on effect of China as the only workshop. Now that is ending and what comes after is just like Roderick says, eventually there's too many people competing unless they're protecting in competed bubbles. Oh, sorry, protected bubbles. So either we get protected bubbles or we have to move back to some form of globalization where you know people do one thing well and I think the one thing we can say about most of the world at the moment is no one wants that again because it allowed China to become what it is and it kept a lot of other people poor for a very long time. So I can't see anyone signing up for a version of globalization if fundamentally wars are now being run by BlackRock rather than the American government. They don't give a shit about globalization. They just want to make money where they can and have good deals and would rather lock stuff down. Um, France seems smart enough to look out towards the world, you know, and, and see we've got to do our own thing because Europe's going to be totally dysfunctional. Well, so yeah. I just don't see where this global. The... Sorry, you go, Roderick. Um, it, it seems to me we have now the race between yeah. Britain and France to see who gets to dominate Western Europe, and that's very, very much back to 16th century politics. Yep, and I'm voting on France for just being a bit smarter at everything. If they're we, smarter, but we're lucky. If we nah, go, they're smarter and you're meaner. If we go <laughs> that's back, true. Yeah. If we go I back haven't... to a more tactical issue here, gentlemen, pro-war blogger Vladin Tartarsky was killed in a blast in St. in a St. Petersburg cafe. We've heard a lot of stuff go on within Russia with regard to elements of anti-Putinist or pro-Ukrainian people groups. What whatever you want to call them, going about doing the dirty within the sanctity of the Russian state. How significant do you think the assassination of this pro-war blogger um, has, uh, is for the Russian state? Does it show that the Russian state is not on top of security internally as it should be? It kind of kills the myth of lots of Russian myths are getting killed at the moment. And one of them is the all-knowing, all-seeing Russian state, mm -hmm. which is a myth we built for ourselves. And the Russians don't really live under that. Um, there are plenty more bloggers. My suspicion is the line between pro-war and pro-Russian is being a bit blurred here. Because if you're pro-Russian at the moment, you are pro-war. Mm. Not necessarily the same thing. Um, and the fact that he was making the point, I'm pro-war, but we're doing a shit job of it. So he was oh, trying yeah. to use the pro-war thing to cover. So I actually think he was probably killed by the system, not by anyone outside the system. I don't know. It's really, comp that, you know, the number of what we insist on calling oligarchs who've gone flying out of their buildings in the last six months. Mm. And everyone's going, it's Putin, it's Putin, it's Putin. My suspicion is Putin's doing about half of that and we're doing about half of that. And I don't know which ones are which, because mm. we don't know the details. Mm. Um, my suspicion is this was Ukrainians rather than Russians. And we will never really know. In the long run, Russia will become 
a meaner, harder place, much more down on its subversives than it's been pretty much since the revolution. Well, I'll go back to my comment of, you know, eight months ago, now they're going to become the big hermit kingdom. Yeah. Except certainly as long as they've got Lavrov and Putin. But they won't for much longer because the of their age. Yes. Yes. Age is a thing. I mean, we don't know what happens when with who's next. Mm. And if it's, you know, they're all hardliners. Mm. The last two moderates are, are Putin and Lavrov. Yeah, even if we take Medvedev, you know, he's now gone, put the headband on real tight and decided <laughs> where his, his you know, true future lies. So even if we view Medvedev as the, you know, the least freaky of the freaks, we've got a big hermit kingdom. And that'll shoot, suit Xi perfectly because she wants a big hermit kingdom. There are different big hermit kingdoms. Except there's a lot of people who are going to be in on the big hermit kingdom, like all of Africa and most of South America. Yeah, but the great thing with the Hermit Kingdom is you can trade with everybody. You can set up university cities to educate everybody, but you still treat your population like you do, as we say, or else. Again, the the, the Russian you know, version of the Chinese social credit system for whether you do military service. What a great export of technology and ideas. But we also are taking on. What about um, Blinken and uh, his demands to Russia to release U.S. journalist Evan Gershkovich, I think his name is? Um, you know, again, it's it's a, it's one of those tactical issues between the United States and Russia. Do you think that there's going to be an escalation of this kind of thing where U.S. journalists or anyone of American origin that happens to be on the wrong side of the border will actually treat it will be treated rather grubbly i mean um there was that griner affair as well where you had the basketball basketballer that was you know caught up in all sorts of things what do you think advantages the russian state by doing this sort of thing i mean really what what, what were the charges that they put on to uh gershkovich what that um he was he was delving into national security issues well i mean he's a journalist it doesn't really matter what the the accusation was the reality was it was time in the russian news store you know cycle Hmm. for bad west at a human level rather than a political level Hmm. so it's just part of the cycle i mean there is also another factor is that it's a you nab one, we nab one. The Americans got one last two, three weeks ago, and and you swap them and you change them. That's a very old-fashioned Cold War thing. And who nabbed the first one? I guess it's probably us because we kicked everything off this time. Um, yeah. It's tit for tat. It's just part we'll of the deal. media cycle. That's all it is. Yeah. And and as with the the, the basketball woman, I mean. The Americans so screwed that up internationally because there was an ex-soldier. Now, there's lots to be said about who and what this ex-soldier was, but you had a choice between an ex-soldier with loads of medals, probably spying for the United States, and you had a choice between a basketball player who was clearly guilty of a legitimate Russian crime. And we chose the basketball player, well, we, the, the Biden administration. Yeah, but of course they did. Because otherwise yeah, her wife do. would have looked sad on TV. Again, yeah, none of this then, is anything but the comm cycle. Yes, and then you play that message in Africa, in um, the Middle East, in all the the stands of the world, and they all go, are you crazy? Are you crazy? You left your soldier behind in exchange for this woman. Yeah, but the interesting thing is when they did get the soldier out, they traded him for a low-level drug dealer. Yeah. So, you know, again, the tit-for-tat thing. The Russians understand the optics. The Americans only understand the optics. Oh, sorry. The Russians understand the optics for the entire world. The Americans only think in terms of the optics for their own voting public. So it's the great advantage of not taking democracy seriously is you can get on with running optics seriously at a global level. Mm. And, you know, and the Russians got the Lord of War. Can't sell that message any yeah, loud. Yeah, come on, getting getting Victor back has to be a cool day. Now we got to rewatch the Nicolas Cage movie. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Roderick, I have a question for you, and that is, why hasn't Bakhmut fallen yet? Oh, it's a double envelopment. Um, how do I put this? You got to. The last time I was on, I was going to start talking about the numbers, 
David shot me down with an emotional narrative. And I just like, I don't have an answer for that. I, I, I don't deal with emotions very well. Um, you've got to look at the numbers. So from the top, uh, all of Europe makes 5,000 shells a month. We don't know how many the Americans make. Don't know how many the Russians make, but we can kind of guesstimate. Uh, the Ukrainians are firing 20,000 a week. The Russians are firing 20,000 a day, sometimes up to 40,000 a day. The Wagner Group is firing 20,000 a day into Bakhmut. So the, the Wagner Group is firing more than the entire Ukrainian army. Ukrainians cannot let Bakhmut go. There is a strategic reason for it in that it's a linchpin. There's a massive emotional component in that if it falls, they're really scared they're gonna end up against the back of a wall. Um, so Wagner and the, and, and the Russian army proper have Bakhmut encircled. They've been slowly, slowly, slowly squeezing building up the emotional draw and then come the Ukrainians and then come the Ukrainians and then they die. So that's why we get the figures, guesstimated figures, reasonably guesstimated, that the Ukrainians have lost 80,000 men defending Mahmoud. Uh, and that's all sorts of losses. Um, there was one American uh, volunteer mercenary who guesstimated that Ukrainians had a life expectancy of four hours in Bakhmut. Why schlep to the other side of Ukraine to kill Ukrainians when you can just sit there, shoot at them, go back and have coffee? Um, it's, it's a great killing space. And now it's double enveloped. So there's one road in, there's one road out. You can't drive along it, you've got to walk it. You can't take out your heavy armor. The Ukrainians have blown up their own bridge. It's a killing space. And um, and the Russians are happy to stay there and kill. So what, and do you, what do you make of the reports, though, that, you know, the Russians themselves have put so much effort and energy in the entire special military operation that Russian defense industry is having a hard time keeping up with its own production and supply issues. Therefore, they are now dipping into the well that is Cold War material. I mean, they've been doing that with shells, for instance, and even some missiles, Cold War missiles. But uh, they're certainly doing it with armor. You know, um, the the idea of being able to retrofit a T sixty four for modern twenty first century tank warfare sounds like a bit of a stretch to me. And considering the fact they're that not placed under so many sanctions, and a lot of their modern equipment, like say, for instance, what you find in an Amata T fourteen tank or or you know many of the modern Su thirty five fighters and and their derivatives, they do have Western components. Some of those components come from France. Some of them come from nefarious sources, but have been sort of shuttled around. But you know those 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 avenues have now been pretty much closed to the Russians. So how do you think they can continue pushing their military barrow as hard as they have? Um, because you know the Chinese are providing the Russians with lethal aid at least not in the quantities that you would think would be war winning <clears throat> where are they getting their technology and industrial support for sustaining their war effort from okay so there's an easy answer and there's a complicated answer okay why are they struggling well i think we're massively overstating why they're struggling but they're struggling because they've added a, they're in the process of adding a million extra soldiers you cannot arm and equip a million extra soldiers with brand new equipment. Nobody can do it. Nobody's ever been able to do it. The Americans kind of did it in the Second World War, but after they turned their entire economy into a war, in, a war economy. Hmm. Um, the tanks are largely being used as um, assault guns and um, motorized artillery is my understanding. But like Russia makes and refurbishes at the moment a thousand tanks a year. Britain struggles to get into the double figures. And they're gonna go from make and refurbish to make a thousand brand new tanks a year. They've got a million shells um, for the, the older models in storage. And they're building a new tank army of a thousand tanks. 
course you're going to have to go into your old stock, especially if these guys are never going to face an actual tank. Because keep in mind, you know, we make big fuss about all the Western stuff that's going. Britain's sending 12 tanks. I think Canada's sending eight against a standing tank army of already 3,000 modern Russian tanks, plus the extra thousand they're bringing off the line out of storage. I mean, it's, it's numbers. Um, as to the equipment stuff, the, the, thing, the thing with China is it's not for Russia, it's for China. Chinese have never tested their stuff. Mm, they don't right. know if it works. And here's a place to play. Why aren't we seeing J-20 fighters being flown by Russian pilots? Well, that would be a great way of testing the equipment. That's what the Russians did often during the Cold War to find out whether or not their stuff worked, right? Yeah. Well, A, it's probably a matter of time, and B, the Russians have no shortage of planes. And it's not a plane-friendly combat zone. Because... Although the Ukrainian defences are largely wiped out, they're still arguably the second best air defences in the world after the Russians. There's not a lot of planes. Can I just say something here about this? You know, a lot has been said in the media about, you know, the um, redundancy of armoured warfare, especially in the early start of the war where we started seeing tanks go up because of you know, um, um, javelins and various other Western air uh, shoulder-launched um, uh, missiles to soldiers in ukraine uh you know there was story after story saying the tank is now a redundant piece of equipment and yet uh, the the only thing that i think is redundant on the ukrainian battle space is the combat aircraft because of the unfriendly air envelope that they have to pass through to drop their ordnance um the only pe- yeah. the only pieces of aerial equipment that people feel comfortable playing around with at the moment are drones but those airplanes are only really redundant in three or four airspaces, which are Ukraine, Belarus, Russia, and China. Those aircraft are not redundant in Western Europe because we don't have air defense systems like the Ukrainians. Mm. We rely on aircraft. Mm. Yeah, we do. That's right. We over rely on aircraft. And, you know, if BlackRock really wants to make their money, they should be selling a Russian style air defense system. And they could sell 26 of them to Europe. Because mm. every European country is going to need them and they're all going to have to be bespoke. And interoperability will be key. And again, that's the advantage of buying an American product where one company has that level of influence. Yeah. yeah. Again, Bakhmut is an interesting case because the Russians are set up to just pour fire into it. The Ukrainians feel they can't lose it. Attrition is the thing the Russians have got going for them. They need time to get ready for the Thunder Run out of Belarus to Kiev. And every week they can bleed the Ukrainians in Bakhmut is an easier week later when they destroy Kiev. Really doesn't matter what the losses are from a Russian perspective in Bakhmut. As long as they can sit far enough back with enough artillery and keep it a misery and keep it you know, as a message that really... It doesn't matter if in the end this is one single crater full of blood and steel. It's irrelevant. It does the job. I do think you have to have a... We don't know what any side's casualty numbers are. No, the the numbers are all bullshit. Looking at at the sources, my educated guesstimation is the Russians have lost, killed and wounded between 30 and 40,000. And that the Ukrainians have lost, killed, and wounded somewhere in the region of 600,000. That's a at huge least a differential. Ten, it's, if you think about it, they're putting 10 times as much munition in the air, and they're not doing very many frontal assaults. Yep, they're the just Ukrainians wrecking are doing the stuff. Assaults. Yep. They're standing there and shooting and drinking tea. All right, so, so getting back to what David was uh, um, inferring earlier, this this notion of a Russian thunder run from Belarus into Kiev, do you think that that's actually possible? At the moment, the Western media seems to be focusing on the impending Ukrainian counteroffensive to liberate Crimea and the Donbass. Nice story. So what, uh, what, what kind of thunder run do you expect from Belarus? And when do you think is the most likely time for the Russians to hit? Who do you um, want to go first? My guess is... No, you go first, Daniel. Um, 
David. Okay. Yeah, my feeling is this is all just being delayed because no one wants to do it in mud because, of course, why it failed last year is because they had to stay on the road. Mm. And it's been a much warmer winter, which means the ground didn't get hard enough. There's plenty of mud. There still is plenty of mud. But, you know, you'd have to imagine early May onwards, all this refitted kit or pulled out of storage kit, at least 400,000 people able to go down the road, you know, seven or eight columns wide, straight across fields, blowing up every fence and wall necessary on the way through. So it's a wave doing so under good, you know, air cover. Uh, and that's the game changer. My view is Belarus. So you have to keep in mind there are three big pockets of Russian reserves. Uh, center one that's clearly going to go all the way to Dnieper. The southern one, which I think is to take um, Odessa. And Odessa matters on so many complicated mm. emotional yeah. levels to the Russians. I don't think Belarus moves unless the Poles are stupid enough to cross the border. The Poles cross the border, the Belarusian forces go in. Yeah, but there's only 60,000 of them. I mean, uh, Belarus is not a, it, a European power of any consequence, right? No, no, I mean, not the Belarusian. effectively an internal security force. Mm. Yeah, the Russians in Yeah, Belarus. the Russian forces in the, Belarus. And I think that right. number of 60,000, again, whatever the real number of Russians who've now been trained and moved up is, having them under a quote-unquote tactical nuclear umbrella is a great way to prepare the biggest staging ground of, well, literally the 21st century for the biggest have... armoured operation of the 21st century. But we haven't seen any uh, evidence that there is this massive Russian build-up in Belarus. We know that there are Russian forces in Belarus, but, you know, like um, we were witnessing this, this massive build-up of Russian forces on the border of Ukraine prior to the Russian special military operation, um, we're not seeing a similar sort of build-up with its strike force aimed at Kyiv. Is, is this a deliberate act on behalf of Western media being told to be quiet about this sort of thing? Or do you think... Um, you know, it's it's also a case of maybe the Russians haven't got their idea on opening up another northern front. Maybe they are really focused on the defense of Crimea and and, and the southern Donbass area and the, and the land bridge with Crimea. Interesting thing about Belarus is because uh, so much Western trucking went through there, it actually has better roads. And at some point, the Russians are going to learn we're just going to buy tank transporters. And there are more roads in Belarus you can use them on than basically anywhere else in Russia. Mm. So they don't need to be sitting two Ks behind the border. They have more capacity if it's a long-term logistical plan to have stuff everywhere and bring it up more effectively in Belarus than they can from any other direction. Yeah. And then the other thing is that like the Russians withdrew all their paratroopers. That's why they gave up... Um, oh, um, not Kharkov, what's the other one? Yes, His brain's one. gone blank. The one that the Russian, that the Ukrainians were celebrating like crazy and my brain has just gone completely blank because it's three o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh God, it's the one that's on the river and the Russians couldn't hold Kursan. it because they couldn't supply Yeah, Kurzon. Yeah. So Kurzon was held by Paris, by Russian Paris. And what did they do? Well, we can't hold this because we've got to supply it across the river. We just put a whole bunch of artillery pieces on the other side of the river and the Ukrainians can only hold it with like a handful of guys waving flags. They can't put anything serious there. Um, and all those paras got pulled out. And we don't know where they're gone. Mm. Mm. And are and they the main training of... cohort for an awful lot of new, slightly better than average infantry to be attached to armored columns? Quite possibly. Yeah. yeah. Um, I my my personal view is you are not going to get big push you're going to get big squeeze um and the only reason you'd get a big push is if the ukrainians simply cease to exist as a force and that's and my Russians suspicion is that actually it's getting to that point because even though i don't agree with your numbers on bakhmut bakhmut is still an indication that what we have seen is a winter of attrition that was different than everyone planned for but still a case that the ukrainians went from zero to total population involvement so quick and it gives them an ability to do a lot more than a normal country because it is existential threat. 
but 42 to 43 million people, there's only a certain proportion that can do most jobs, take on most roles, and eventually it just stops working. And the question is, at what date does it stop working? And if it's been as successful in Bakhmut as it appears it might have been, simply at attrition. Um, we're a lot closer to that day where the Ukrainians can't be in two places anymore and can't refit anymore and can't rearm anymore. Yeah. There's another factor which we're not really taking into account, which is the Ukrainians have massively disproportionately drawn their forces from ethnic Hungarian and ethnic Romanian forces, uh, populations. Mm. And they're throwing them ethnic using the russians to commit ethnic cleansing and at some point you're going to get a prison where every guy around there's a hungarian or a romanian they go why are we dying for ukraine yeah but it's the and same thing with the russians that they've exactly. basically thrown anyone from a mini stan into the shit fight first yeah. and yeah. this is why yeah. we've never seen the top tier russian units because they're all at home for po population control, control. <laughs> also they're winning no, they're at home for population control, and they so, will I mean, stay at home for population control. Okay, guys, what I mean so, is the Russians are winning, so they don't need them. So, so if the Russians are winning uh, and Russia resumes the uh, UN presidency, what are we likely to see as a consequence of that? I mean, you know, there are a lot of people that are rather cynical about the power and the prestige of the United Nations these days, and and even of the UN Security Council. So are we likely to see Russia and China start dictating terms to the rest of the UN Security Council on matters close to their heart? What do you think is the likely outcome of that? Start it's off with UN. Roderick. It's the UN. A, it doesn't matter. I mean, it matters emotionally to the Russians, probably only the Russians. Um, my guess is the Russians will push for war crimes tribunals against the Ukrainians for their very real atrocities and Britain and France and America will veto it. And then the Russians will take that to the Africans and say, see, I told you. That's the sum total, which they're going to do anyway. I mean, everything we do, because we do it so cack handedly, the Russians take the Africans and the Arabs and the South Americans say, these guys are douchebags. And you know they're douchebags. And here's some more proof that they're douchebags because we're run by clowns. David? I'll go back to my earlier comment. Everything the West will do at the UN at that level will be about the next election cycle. Everything the Russians and Chinese will do is about showing the world, look, we might be awful, but we're better than them. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you either play the comms war or you, know, you keep thinking winning at home is what matters and winning at home doesn't matter if the world gets nastier. Well, that's a very somber note to, to end this podcast on, but I think I will take that as our final point. David, thank you very much for being with us on Strategic On. And of course, Roderick, thank you to you for being up at this extremely early hour. So get thee to bed right now. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Well, that's a wrap, everyone. My thanks to our special guest, Roderick Miller, for being on Strategic On. My thanks also to co-host David Olney and producer Michael Magali for their contributions. And to our audience, thanks for listening. Remember that you can subscribe to the audio version of Strategicon through the Ozcast Network, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, and on the Sage International site, sageinternational.com.au, hitting the media drop-down button and clicking podcasts. Also, please like us on the Sage International Facebook site and follow us on Twitter. All your likes and subscriptions will help the algorithm find us and bump us up the social media rankings. You can also watch our podcasts on video through the Strategic on Raw YouTube channel. Also, please comment on any of our podcasts through Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and of course on the Sage International site. We welcome any constructive feedback that can help improve our products, and we look forward to engaging with our followers. Until next time, goodbye. Oscar.